after loss. It's titled Sleep After Loss. And I am super excited for it. It's one of the topics that uh, has been close to my heart since undergrad uh, studies. And like, there's just such a lack of understanding within our culture about it. So as much as grief is also unrecognized within our culture and the knowledge there, um, sleep literacy is also pretty poor within our culture. And so I'm really happy to present uh, Dr. Michael Mack, uh, who is a sleep uh, medicine specialist and staff psychiatrist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. He also provides cultural mental health care for the Hong Fook Mental Health Association. Uh, Dr. Mack is the assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto and adjunct research professor at Western University. He is currently the site director for undergrad medical education for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and the PGY5 transition to practice coordinator for the postgraduate psychiatry training program at the University of Toronto. He serves on the education committees of the Canadian Psychiatric Association and American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was also named fellow of the Canadian Psychiatric Association in 2022. And Dr. Mack was recently elected VP clinical of the Canadian Sleep Society last year. And so huge bio, he has a lot of knowledge. So really, you know, if you have a question, this is the man to ask when it comes to this topic. Um, so today's session, we'll have about, he'll do an educational presentation followed by the, the Q&A period. And so now is my pleasure to really hand this session over to Dr. Mack so we can all learn a little bit more about sleep after loss. And so I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very generous uh, introduction, uh, Joshua. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for spending uh, your lunch uh, hour uh, with me. Um, my uh, main academic goal is to spread uh, the word of uh, sleep health and sleep science uh, across the country internationally. And uh, bereavement and sleep after loss is an intersection of, uh, of you know, multiple parts of my interests, which include uh, late life depression, which, uh, you know, there's great overlap with bereavement. So, um, I will begin. So these are just my disclosures. Now, the objectives for today, uh, after completion of uh, this session, um, you're, you're going to, you know, have a, a greater understanding of what bereavement means as a diagnosis, its mechanics, and, uh, you know, how, how we assess for it, really. You know, I think it bears uh, repeating, you know, what bereavement means uh, by definition. And of course, uh, we're going to review uh, sleep disturbances that are associated with loss and, and personal loss and bereavement. And, and why that's important for uh, health in general. And then afterwards, after knowing what the problems are, uh, we're gonna look at some solutions. Uh, you know, what are treatments uh, that might be helpful for sleep disturbances that are uh, associated with bereavement? So, you know, going back in, in terms of history, I think it's, all, it's always important to, to know the history of, you know, medicine and, and the conditions that uh, develop and, and evolve with time. And, uh, bereavement as a diagnosis, uh, back when, when uh, I was in the middle of my training in 2013, on the left-hand side, you see a, a photograph of, of what was then the, the diagnostic manual for psychiatrists like me. So that's a, a page from the uh, diagnostic uh, manual, uh, the fourth edition uh, text revision. And it touches on depression symptoms, things that we can all uh, relate to. So, you know, uh, feelings of low mood, uh, losing the ability to enjoy things you like usually, having imp impediments to your sleep, your concentration, having low energy, um, and maybe having, you know, impacted appetite. And in the most severe cases, thoughts that life isn't worth continuing. But if you look at the very bottom, at, at the very bottom where it's highlighted, it says E dot. Okay, the last criteria says the symptoms are not better accounted for by bereavement. So, Back in 2013, uh, we weren't able to diagnose depression in uh, patients, in folks that had suffered recent uh, loss in their lives. And they specify that, uh, you know, depression is associated with loss can't be diagnosed unless it's been more than two months since that loss. So the, the justification for this, according to the American Psychiatric Association, was, is, is what you see on the screen. By advising clinicians not to diagnose depression and recently bereaved individuals, uh, the bereavement exclusion suggested uh, that grief somehow protected uh, someone from major depression. So that seemed to be a problem at the time that, um, you know, 
uh, we're not acknowledging grief that can, can occur uh, from uh, recent loss. So uh, the good news is that uh, the you know we had some guidance uh, in terms of how to uh, describe uh, bereavement as opposed to just uh, a major depressive episode. Uh, specifically, uh, there are differences in, in a variety of characteristics. So in bereavement, you have waves or pangs of grief associated with thoughts uh, or reminders of the person that's been deceased. Uh, Self-esteem is, is different between major depression and bereavement. Uh, in bereavement, it's typically preserved, whereas in uh, folks with major depression, they just feel critical to themselves. They have feelings of worthlessness and they self-loathe. So there were some differences between what we uh, conceptualized as bereavement and major depression. And, and there was an evolution of how we looked at grief. So most recently, a bereavement as a diagnosis is back in uh, our diagnostic manual. We're now down to the fifth edition text revision, and it came out in March, 2022. The formal diagnosis is called prolonged grief disorder. And seven to 10% of uh, adults who are, who are going through bereavement will suffer from this condition. So it is not uh, a rare illness. It's one in 10 uh, adults that are recently bereaving. So the idea here is, is that uh, in folks suffering from prolonged grief disorder, that they have qualitatively different subjective experiences than people who are just simply depressed. There's a greater intensity to the symptoms uh, that, are, that uh, are experienced, and there's longer duration, and there's a resulting functional impairment of the person's life. The, the grief reaction is causing a person to have you know, problems with their work life, their social life, their familial life. And there's been some controversy. Um, criteria for what people call complicated grief or prolonged grief uh, has been changing across time. And, um, you know, uniformity uh, isn't something uh, that, that we have seen uh, when we look at diagnostic criteria. Um, at certain times, folks thought that the distinction between prolonged grief disorder and normal grief was unclear. And there have been some concerns that if we uh, add a label, if we add a diagnosis of uh, specifying grief, that somehow we would be stigmatizing those folks and maybe medicalizing uh, normal human experience. So just in demonstration of what I mean by the differences in how different health organizations around the world conceive of grief, um, the, the orange dots are how uh, we psychiatrists perceive uh, prolonged grief and, and its symptoms. And, and the different colored dots represent different organizations that have different uh, criteria for uh, prolonged grief or complicated grief. And you can see that while there are similarities, there are also substantial differences. But what I'm working from is this definition, uh, which is from the uh, DSM-5-TR. So prolonged grief disorder involves uh, a patient that has uh, experienced a loss in their personal life, uh, for at least 12 months. And in young people, children and adolescents, that could be uh, within six months ago. And then uh, secondarily, uh, you have to have an experience of either an intense yearning or longing for the deceased person or having a preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person uh, on, most, on most days uh, and nearly every day for at least one month. And then uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see the third set of uh, criteria, and you need three of those eight uh, symptoms uh, for most days and nearly every day for at least one month. So uh, feeling a part of yourself has died since the death of your loved one, um, you know, having a marked sense of disbelief about death, um, having intense emotional pain, feeling that life is meaningless as a result of the death, etc. So if you meet this criteria, then you are suffering from prolonged grief disorder and certainly it's a condition that deserves treatment. If you meet criteria, it's causing you issues in your life. And again, it would be time to, to seek maybe, you know, professional help. So in terms of a nice systematic way of assessing this, because there are a lot of questions, as you can see from the criteria that you could ask, you know, there's this uh, PG-13R scale, which is a prolonged grief uh, self-administered questionnaire. And uh, you know, this is, you can, you know, hand this uh, to the cl clients and patients that you see uh, that might be suffering from prolonged grief. Uh, they fill in them themselves. They rate their symptoms, as you can see in the screen, on a five-point Likert scale. And if you score 30 and above, then you're most likely meeting criteria for 
uh, pro uh, prolonged grief disorder and you should be giving them some sort of treatment. Okay, transitioning to what we're talking about today. Sleep issues is more the rule than the exception in the recently bereaved. And uh, an oft cited uh, uh, statistic is that 80% of the bereaved will suffer from some sort of sleep problem. So four out of five people who are recently bereaved will have a sleep issue. So let's talk about sleep symptoms that can occur in uh, the bereaved. Well, uh, first off, it's probably unsurprising to us that you know problems falling asleep or staying asleep are common to prolonged grief disorder and bereavement in general. You know, uh, stressful life events doesn't have to be bereavement will cause those types of symptoms. And of course, repetitive thoughts about lost loved ones at bedtime can interfere with your ability to, to fall asleep or stay asleep. So um, severity of grief and the severity of sleep disturbances were associated, meaning that if you suffered from a, a greater severity of grief symptoms or intensity, then your sleep problems were uh, much worse. And, and I think that makes sense to all of us. The good news is that with time, the tincture of time, uh, these sleep disturbances associated with grief uh, do tend to improve. Uh, the issue is, is that, you know, are these improvements uh, quick enough so that, you know, uh, our patients and clients can go back to doing whatever they want to do with, with their lives? Specifically in young people, we again see a high prevalence of sleep problems after a traumatic loss. 45 to 88% of children and adolescents will have sleep issues after uh, a personal loss in their lives. And they disproportionately suffer from greater incidence of uh, nightmares at nighttime, which interrupt their sleep. And the lucky thing again is with time that does seem to improve. Uh, we don't see an association between bereavement and sleep breathing disorders like sleep apnea. Now, uh, this is a very nice uh, study from the Netherlands. It just came out, published February 2024, uh, recognizing that, right, there's 80% of people that who suffer, 80% of people who are bereaved will suffer from sleep issues. They wanted to see how insomnia symptoms evolve with time. So, they found 220 participants. These are people with, uh, who have suffered a recent personal loss. They were followed for a one year duration and they described three separate insomnia trajectories. They have a resilient trajectory, meaning that even though the person suffered a significant personal loss, they did not make complaints of problems falling asleep or staying asleep. There was the recovering group where there was an in initial period of disturbed sleep. So problems falling asleep and staying asleep but in that year period, they were able to improve their sleep back to what they were, uh, their baseline sleep. So they, they got worse with the, with the initial loss and then with time, things got better. And then lastly, they described a chronic trajectory. So, you know, these are the, these are the folks that they suffered a personal loss and they weren't able to bounce back in terms of their sleep. They continued to have problems falling asleep or staying asleep throughout the 12 month period. So having a traumatic loss uh, was negatively associated uh, with uh, your trajectory. So you, you were less likely to have a resilient trajectory if you suffered a traumatic loss. And that would be uh, defined as a loss that you didn't expect, you know, a person passing away from an accident or, or a very uh, swift uh, illness. And baseline depression symptoms were the best predictor of the type of insomnia trajectory that you would see. So a person that was more depressed, having more problems with uh, low energy and concentration, uh, greater feelings of yearning, they tended to have worse sleep. And I think, again, that makes sense. Now, what maybe the take home message from this study is that at their year follow up, the people with the chronic trajectory, 60% of them still met criteria for prolonged grief disorder. Compare that with only 9% if they had a resilient insomnia trajectory. And then 27% uh, uh, people uh, with the recovering trajectory uh, still met criteria for PGD. So uh, what we're looking at is that if you had very poor sleep, you, your grief symptoms probably didn't go away in that fall period. And that leads to substantial differences in terms of health outcomes for those folks. I'm gonna show you some evidence that you know, a person that sleeps poorly after bereavement uh, may be at greater risk of a, a number of health concerns. What are the, so what are the risks for worse sleep and bereavement and loss? 
while increasing age uh, was a predictor of worse sleep, sleep symptoms. And that might go hand in hand with the fact that for some of us, I mean, for most of us, actually, as we get older, our ability to have uh, quality sleep and to stay asleep in the middle of the night deteriorates. What was interesting is that in studies of looking at sleep disturbances and bereavement, there were some uh, patterns that we would see. So as an example, uh, there's greater disturbances observed in younger compared to older widowers. And same thing with adolescents who lost a parent as, com as compared to uh, adults who are bereaved. So maybe that's reflective of, you know, uh, younger adolescents not having uh, developed uh, maturity uh, in their uh, coping mechanisms uh, as compared to their, the adult versions of themselves if they lose a parent. And parentally bereaved older children uh, compared to young ones, they have uh, greater uh, sleep disturbances. So, um, and there's mixed evidence right now uh, as to whether natural loss versus an unexpected loss defined by, you know, passing away from a car accident or illness related deaths led to worse sleep between the groups. Right now, there's no separation uh, uh, when we look at the cause of the, of the bereavement. The interesting thing is that uh, independent of what, you know, sleep studies showed or uh, sleep trackers showed, uh, it was the personal experience of the quality of sleep of the patients that mattered most. Uh, that leads to uh, the, the association with the, the grief symptoms, not so much objective testing. So um, looking at treatments for grief and, and how uh, they affect sleep, um, there is a treatment called complicated grief therapy, uh, you know, and it was championed by work, uh, by, by the work uh, of our colleagues in Pittsburgh. Um, complicated, complicated grief therapy is a specialized therapy uh, designed to treat uh, folks who, are, who have suffered recent bereavement. Uh, it integrates interpersonal psychotherapy with cognitive behavioral techniques to address trauma-like symptoms that they modified uh, from exposure therapies used for PTSD as an example, because there's some overlap with the symptoms. And what they saw was that when a person got this complicated grief therapy, uh, their sleep disturbances uh, improved much more than just interpersonal psychotherapy, but the sleep problems persisted regardless of treatment. So the residual insomnia symptoms, uh, even though sleep could improve from uh, grief-related treatments. So why does this matter? You know, what I've shown you is that uh, people with bereavement have bad sleep. The worse uh, the grief symptoms, the worse the sleep is. And that if we try to treat the, the, the grief, uh, there's still some residual sleep issues that, that stay behind. Well, we know that the bereavement and the residual sleep symptoms are associated with a uh, greater risk of cancer, of high blood pressure, negative changes to your eating habits, and for some, some of you that like, like statistics, if a person has a prolonged sleep latency, meaning that it takes them a longer time to fall asleep than what is usual to them, and at a minimum, it means uh, taking more than half an hour to fall asleep, that's associated with two, uh, two times greater risk of death. And sleep efficiency, which is calculated by dividing your total sleep time by the time that you're lying down in bed, if that's less than 80%, that's also associated with a 1.9 times greater risk of death. So having sleep problems that come from bereavement uh, leads to significant health uh, risks. So in summary, uh, prolonged grief disorders associated with sleep disturbances, uh, comorbid depression and worse depression symptoms predicted worse sleep trajectory. Uh, you're more likely to have a chronic uh, uh, insomnia symptom trajectory if, if you had bad depression at the beginning. Um, insomnia symptoms tended to persist even after targeted grief treatments. And I showed you some stats that uh, show that sleep disturbances are associated with negative health outcomes, in including increased risk of death. And worse sleep disturbances are associated with greater uh, prolonged grief disorder prevalence with time. So now that we know, you know uh, what the problems are, uh, let's talk about some solutions. So uh, I'm going to talk about insomnia, but I just want to tell you about, you know, uh, the definitions of what we're working with. So uh, if we're if we're talking about insomnia disorder, you know, this is something that we must treat. So it's defined as a nighttime problem. 
So a problem falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up too early. And of course, a disorder is not a disorder unless it causes you some sort of daytime dysfunction. So a problem with work, a problem with your social or familial life. And the duration is such that you have to demonstrate the symptoms for at least three times a week for three months. Now, if we're talking about just the general population at any given point, if you ask, you know, a hundred people, uh, do you have a problem falling asleep, staying or staying asleep or waking up too early? That represents about 30% of the general population. Furthermore, if you add to that a daytime impairment criteria, meaning now your nighttime issues are causing you a daytime problem, then it affects about 10 to 15% of all folks. Furthermore, if you add a duration criteria, now that the symptoms are occurring for three times a week for three months straight, then you're looking at six to 10% of all folks. And you know, in the bereavement uh, uh, subpopulation, it's gonna be somewhere higher than that. You know, we don't have the precise number because it's very hard to you know, study that population, but it's gonna be above 10%. And it's certainly gonna be above the 13% that we see is the average for Canada specifically. It's not 80% because 80% that 80% statistic will include people that only have problems falling asleep, but they can still go to work and they're not personally affected, or their symptoms only occur one time a week for one month as opposed to three times a week for three months. But it's going to be some number higher than 10, but definitely less than 80%. So I mentioned in Canada, the average is about 13%. Um, and uh, insomnia dis disproportionately affects female gender. Um, and then uh, it affects older adults with the greatest prevalence, up to 40%. Now, the, the number one treatment, the best treatment for, for insomnia is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So uh, no matter where we've tested this, uh, we can show great evidence that it helps people fall asleep quicker, stay asleep longer, and, and uh, produce uh, the sensation that their sleep quality is much better. So uh, when we compare it with medications, it seems to work just as good, if not better. And the, the benefit is there's no significant side effects. You know, to, to, to take this therapy, it's akin to going to a course that teaches you how to sleep better. The only downside is that you have to spend time on this. Whereas if you take sleeping medications, you know, uh, you know th there's, there's the bad that comes with the good. There might be some side effects that you might suffer from. And then lastly, the gains are durable, meaning that we can complete this course of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Generally speaking, your insomnia symptoms won't return. And it's for those reasons that this is the best treatment that's out there. Now, specifically looking at sleep problems in people who are bereaved, uh, there's only one randomized control trial, uh, a well-designed uh, study looking at the, eff the efficacy, you know, how effective is this therapy in people who are bereaved with sleep issues, with insomnia. So this is a study that's only recently been done. You can see at the bottom there, it was published in June of 2021. And by the way, before this, there was only one other study that looked at uh, targeted insomnia treatments in people who are recently bereaved. And that study was from 2009. So, but this one is well-designed. Uh, you, you, you have like an active group and you have a control group and they found 21 participants. These are parents of children who passed away from cancer. They met criteria for the insomnia. I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, and what they did was the active group uh, was receiving internet-based cognitive therapy treatments. So the therapy was uh, delivered through an online website. And then the control group uh, just received a booklet that they accessed through the internet. They could download and print, and it teaches you the basics of sleep hygiene, uh, some information about why sleep is important for your health and some uh, preliminary or, you know, just entry level stress management strategies. And what they found was that, you know, no surprise, this cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia group demonstrated significant reduction of insomnia immediately after finishing the course, but also at nine months and 18 months, demonstrating that, you know, the improvements to sleep uh, were durable with time, even though you know, a year and six months passed, their, their sleep was still significantly improved. And if that's the case, then maybe we're protecting those folks uh, in terms of physical health outcomes. So what, is, what does this therapy actually look like? There's five components and I'll describe to you what they are. I've listed uh, the components there, which are sleep restriction, stimulus control, relaxation-based interventions, cognitive restructuring, and sleep hygiene education. So. One thing I want to point out, and it's that 
in medical education and and you know when I go to the, my doctor's office is that you know we're always taught sleep hygiene and most of us know to some extent what that means you know keeping your bedroom uh, cool dark and quiet having a comfortable bed uh, not using nicotine uh, alcohol or exercising too close to your bedtime but by itself that one component of CBT for insomnia has actually not been demonstrated to treat to treat uh, chronic insomnia effectively. So if you meet the criteria, having a nighttime symptom, causing a daytime issue, and it's lasted for three months, uh, three times a week for three months straight, then, then sleep hygiene is not effective in treating those folks with that kind of insomnia. So um, traditionally speaking, therapies like this are given on a one-to-one -one format, uh, which is a main challenge for, for this therapy and, and almost all other therapies. For the reason demand for treatments like this is extremely high and trained therapists, the supply of them is very, very low. So to bridge that gap, um, you know, it's been investigated to see if it's effective in uh, use in group, uh, in group settings where there's one therapist and maybe eight to 10 uh, uh, participants in a group. Uh, they've investigated to see if it works, uh, if it's delivered through the internet, through cell phone apps, and it transpires that it does work. As long as you have the discipline to follow uh, the directions from the therapy itself. So as with anything that's, you know, uh, effective and helpful in life, there are things that we have to be careful about. So it's not a one size fits all strategy. So cognitive therapy is great for most folks, but we need to be careful about giving it to patients and, and, and participants and clients with uh, a history of seizures, uh, bipolar disorder, and, and, and those who have a significant falls risk. Because one big component of this therapy is sleep restriction. So, you know, sleep restriction is one of the main principles of this therapy. And what we're asking uh, folks to do is to reduce the amount of time that they're spending in bed. And that naturally increases our drive to sleep. So for some of us uh, that do overnight shifts, um, you know, for those of us that work at, you know, Canada Post or as a nurse, you'll know that the longer you're, you stay awake for, the sleepier you become. So, you know, in this way, when we ask patients with insomnia to spend less time in bed, we're driving them, we're increasing their natural drive to become sleepy. So, you know, uh, the version of uh, the version of myself that's been up for 20 hours is sleepier than the version of myself that's been only up for 12. So, so we're using that that method to drive natural sleepiness. Stimulus control uh, seeks to reverse the conditioning, the association between the bedroom and a failure to sleep, and this is what we tell folks to do. And these are skills; these are suggestions that we can apply to ourselves to to optimize our own sleep. So first off, you'd like, we'd like you to wake up every single day at the same time for the reason your time of first awakening, if it stays stable, that's a proxy for your first exposure to natural light or sunlight or the light in your house. And it's that first light exposure that sets the starting point of your circadian rhythm or your internal body clock for the next 24 hours. If you have a wake time that's all over the place and classically speaking, you know, uh, for folks that have daily responsibilities, uh, you know, most people will have one wake time Monday to, to Friday where they wake up earlier as compared to Saturday and Sunday where there's a tendency to sleep in and, and maybe stay out late. So they sleep late and wake up later. And it causes this uh, artificial jet lag when a person is trying to sleep on, Saturday, uh, on Sunday night and going back to work on Monday. And it takes uh, days for your internal body clock to go back to normal. So waking up every day at the same time is the key to having good sleep. The second part here is, as opposed to your wake time, your sleep time, the time that you go into your bedroom can be different from night to night. And you should only go to bed when you're feeling sleepy. And that's defined as that head nodding feeling that, that we get if you know we've been at a meeting that's been going on for one hour. You look around, people are nodding their heads. And, and I, I also, I sometimes when I go to church and I look around and then people are also nodding their head at the, the 50 minute mark. So um, the reason why your bedtime is going to be different from night to night is this. If you had a very taxing day, uh, you know, you went to the gym for two hours, you, you know, you went to, to class for eight hours, 
on those days when you're uh, you, when you've exerted yourself mentally and physically, you're probably going to be sleepy earlier compared to the days when you've been having a lazy day. You're lying uh, down at home on your sofa watching television. On those on those nights, you might not feel sleepy until later. The third thing is no naps during the daytime. If you take a nap during the daytime, uh, it's going to take away from your your sleep at, at night when it's dark out. Your brain. Uh, does an incredible job of calculating how many hours of sleep you get per 24 hours. And if you start adding naps to your daytime sleep, that subtracts from your nighttime sleep. So if you want to sleep in this one long continuous block at night, then you have to take away the naps. The fourth suggestion is this. If you wake up in the middle of the night and it feels like it's been a long time and you're struggling to fall back asleep again, don't stay in your bedroom. You know, get up out of bed, go to a different room, that's dimly lit and do something boring, like a word search. And when you feel that head nodding feeling, then go back to sleep. And that's that's the method to break that association, that psychological concept of association between your bedroom and a failure to sleep. We want to associate your bedroom with success in sleep and sleepiness and not wakefulness. So uh, I'm sure uh, you know some of you have heard about Pavlov's dog. Um, so this is a psychological experiment where a person would feed uh, their pets, their dogs, uh, and alongside feeding them, they would ring a bell. And they did this several times for a week, maybe two weeks straight. And then after a while, you just ring the bell. And uh, now the dogs are expecting to be fed. They're salivating in anticipation of food because there's an association between the bell and uh, being fed. And it's the same thing with sleep. Sleep is subject association. If you're always lying down in bed and you're wide awake, your brain's going to think, hey, this is what I'm supposed to do. When I'm in bed, I should be awake. And, and that breaks that association. And then lastly, uh, use the bed only for sleep. So there's different ways uh, that we can relax. One way not to do it is ask people just to simply relax and not think about things that stress them out. If you do that, everybody thinks of the stressful things like there's just simply no way it, we saw this in ghostbusters one you know uh, uh there you know they, somebody told dan Aykroyd, don't think of anything bad because the, the bad guy is going to be a manifestation of whatever you think about and then the guy just started thinking about all sorts of things including the michelin man so anyway to truly relax yourself before bed this applies to a lot of folks that they ruminate you know just before going to bed they start planning and problem solving for the issues that are, come, that are going to come about tomorrow, next week, next month, six months from now, the way to do it is you're going to distract yourself uh, by observing and thinking about mundane things. So one method is to really focus on your breathing. There's something called box breathing. It's really helpful where you take a long breath in over four seconds. Once your lungs are filled with air, you hold it for four seconds. Then you're going to slowly expel that air, exhale it over four seconds. And when your lungs are completely empty, hold for four seconds and rinse and repeat three to five times, you're probably going to fall asleep, you know, by your second re repetition. The other thing is that you can close your eyes and visualize uh, something like a fruit, your favorite fruit, whatever that may be. A lot of uh, my patients think about, you know, oranges, the color of the, of, of the texture of the skin and the rind. And, and by, by thinking about just boring things like that, you give yourself a better chance of not stressing yourself up thinking about, you know, your next day of responsibilities and you can fall asleep thereafter. The last way that we tell people, the last method that we tell people is uh, we tell them to uh, make fists and to tense their muscles of their arms and then, uh, you know, reflect about how uh, 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 tensed up they feel and then relax and then make that comparison between relaxation state and tense states of their muscles all the way from the head down to their toes. So cognitive therapy uh, corrects faulty expectations and beliefs that interfere with sleep. So uh, common things uh, that I hear, uh, if I don't get eight hours of sleep a night, I'm going to be, I'm going to die. I can't function. I'm going to fail out of school. And, and the, the truth is not everybody needs eight hours of sleep. It's a bell curve. Some people need less, some people need more. And to expect everyone to have that absolute need for eight hours of sleep is, is not, it's, it's just far from the truth. I mean, it's like saying to people, you need to drink eight cups of water a day. And clearly we know that that's not true. You should just drink when you're feeling thirsty. I, I suspect if you drank eight cups of water a day, you'd be spending a third of it in the bathroom. Anyway, so the point is, we're going to correct faulty expectations about sleep. 
So instead of thinking, oh, my life is going to go down a drain if I don't get my hours of sleep, we want them to feel that, okay, you know what? Uh, I trust that my mind and my body, they'll get the right amount, which is actually the case for almost everybody if you don't stress about sleep uh, uh, too much. So we remind uh, patients and clients to keep real realistic expectations of sleep requirements and daytime alertness. You know, some people need six hours, some people need nine, nine hours. We can't blame insomnia for all daytime impairments. And we know from studying insomnia that it actually leads to fatigue, which is a muscular feeling. It's this feeling that we get if you've gone to the gym for two hours and you go home and you sit on the couch and you, you don't wanna get up, but it doesn't cause sleepiness. So sleepiness is probably more impairing than fatigue in the grand scheme of things. And you know we know that nobody gets perfect sleep every single night of the week. You'll notice that the criteria indicates that the problems falling asleep and staying asleep don't become an issue uh, that, that requires treatment until you have it for three times a week for three months straight. So we need to develop a tolerance to some bad nights here and there. Now, sleep hygiene, I've sort of mentioned to you, we know uh, a lot about these uh, you know, lifestyle and envir environmental factors that we should uh, aspire to. They include things like, you know, avoiding uh, smoking several hours before bed. I like to tell people don't smoke within two hours of bedtime. Same thing with alcohol or caffeine use. Maybe caffeine use, we actually ask folks to refrain from using, you know, coffee and tea and Pepsi Cola uh, at least, you know, four hours before bed. And exercise is good for your nighttime sleep, but, you know, definitely don't do it too close to your bedtime. And again, probably a two hour window is best away from sleep because if you're all worked up and, and your heart is pumping, you know, your blood at a higher rate and a higher force, it's hard for you to wind down to sleep. And then you need to keep your bedroom cool, dark and quiet and keep a regular sleep schedule. So I, I showed you the five elements of CBT for insomnia. You can probably apply some of these skills to yourself if you have some insomnia symptoms or if you have friends and family and you want to help them, you, you now have like, you know, a good idea of how to do it. But the five components, I spend a lot of time explaining it to you guys, and everyone is busy. So there's always a push to simplify uh, treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And when they did factor analysis, when they did statistical analysis with math to figure out which of the five components of sleep restriction, stimulus control, cognitive restructuring, relaxation-based therapies, and sleep hygiene, which are the ones that actually matter? And they found out that 99, sorry, 90 per, about 90% to 92% of it is from sleep restriction and stimulus control. So if we, if we throw away the rest of it, you know, it's almost as good and we're saving a hell of a lot of time. So uh, in this very interesting study uh, from a group in New Zealand, and they published them, they published this in the British Journal of General Practice in 2015, um, they trialed a simplified version of the CBT for insomnia. They only focus on sleep restriction. And I'm gonna show you how you can do it to yourself, your family or your friends or your clients or your patients. So very simply put, um, it's just sleep, uh, sleep restriction, stimulus control at play. So let's say a person is goes to bed, let's say a hypothetical case, a person goes to bed at midnight, 12 a.m. Uh, and then they wake up at 8 a.m., okay? but they have insomnia. So by definition, there's gonna be a period of time when they can't fall asleep. And let's say that this person has trouble falling asleep. It takes them an hour to do so. So they actually are lying in bed for eight hours, but they only have seven hours of sleep. So the first step is we're gonna tell them to subtract uh, that amount of time of insomnia time uh, away from their time in bed by pushing the earliest of bedtime later. So in this, uh, example, because the person goes to bed at midnight and only falls asleep at around 1 a.m., their their new earliest to bedtime is exactly that time, 1 a.m. They can't go into the bedroom, uh, let's say at 12.05, 12.15, 12.44, 12.59. They can only go into the bedroom at 1 a.m. So again, if you spend less time in bed, your natural, your, your natural drive to, to, to sleep is going to be increased, right? So now there's only seven hours of uh, of, of time in bed allowed and you you track your sleep for seven to 14 days and you can download sleep diaries online or you can use apps on your on your phone and i'm going to show you some examples of that and if you find that your sleep efficiency which again is your total sleep time divided by the, your time in bed if it's above 85 percent then you can start giving yourself 
some sleep time again by extending your time in bed by allowing yourself to go to sleep earlier now, okay? So in this instance, the person that was going to bed at 1 a.m. at the earliest, their sleep consolidated and improved. You know, the time it took them for them to fall asleep improved to the degree that it, uh, it met the criteria that I show you in the screen. So now, after that week, you can go to bed at 12.45. You're giving yourself an extra 15 minutes in bed now. So the total time that you can actually spend in bed is seven hours and 15 minutes. And you rinse and repeat. As long as your sleep efficiency is 85% uh, and above, then you can start expanding your sleep window by making your earliest to bedtime earlier. So going from 12.45 to 12.30 and then so on and so forth. So 12.30 to 12.15. And then, you know, at some point, now that you're, you're associating your bed with sleep, you, you, you know, your drive to, to, to sleep is better. Uh, you can expand your sleep window back to its original uh, scheduling and, and your sleep is better and you don't have the insomnia anymore. So that's a, that's a simple way to approach this that we can all do in a short amount of time or even explaining it to somebody. Now, I mentioned to you that there's a substantial gap between, um, you know, between uh, the demand for CBT for insomnia and its supply. Uh, this is one of our protégés, uh, Armin Rachmani. He actually did uh, his sleep medicine fellowship at the University of British Columbia. He completed it, and now he's back in Toronto. So he wanted to show us that, you know, by leveraging technology, that we can bridge this uh, gap between supply and demand for CBTI. And on your screen here is the summary of his findings. These, now there's over 360 apps on the Google Play Store or Apple uh, uh, App Store that purport to give cognitive behavioral therapy of insomnia but when you download them and check a lot of them just play relaxing music maybe some sounds associated with the beach or like rain sounds which are all very nice but they're not they don't they haven't been demonstrated to, to treat insomnia these are the apps that actually are validated by studies they're vetted and we know that they actually apply cbt for insomnia principles like the ones i just showed you and maybe the the one to get is insomnia coach the second from the top it's uh, its development was actually subsidized by the American VA program, the Veterans Affairs program. We know that people who are involved in the military uh, have disproportionately greater incidence of insomnia and PTSD and grief reactions, and they paid for this app. So instead of us having to pay for it, they footed the bill. You can download it for free. An insomnia coach. It, it allows you to track your sleep with a sleep diary, and it gives you every. It tells you everything that I just told you maybe even more eloquently and more directly. And if you follow it to a T, your insomnia will be better. So in summary, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is an effective treatment for insomnia. And there's early evidence that CBTI helps in grief associated insomnia. And I showed you a simple and easy method to improve your sleep, which is just to use sleep restriction, stimulus control and sleep hygiene. Uh, whatever insomnia time you have, subtract that from your total time in bed push your earliest to bedtime later, and then slowly expand things when you get better. So last part, I'm just going to touch very briefly on medication treatments for insomnia. You know, you about the behavioral approach, which is the preferred treatment. CBTI is the best treatment. Why am I showing you this about medications? I told you that there's very little access to CBTI and related therapies, and also costs can be an issue. So if milligrams of bed, you know, it's, it's, it all, all it does, it helps you stay asleep. And, and why it's notable is because we know that folks who are bereaved tend to be older and folks who tend to be older with insomnia have mostly a problem staying asleep at night. So this might be one medication to try uh, that's safe. You can't get addicted to it. It doesn't work that way. Um, something to think about if a person is an older bereaved person that can't stay asleep, doxepin, three and six, three to six milligrams of the time. Now, a lot is said about melatonin. It's the neurohormone of darkness. I have special receptors in my eyes that detect uh, the sun going down because the sun exhibits a certain type of blue wavelength light. And as soon as my eyes detect a drop in that wavelength light, then I secrete melatonin from my pineal gland. And it tells me that I need to start feeling sleepy. So in people, specifically people who are older, you know, uh, an older person who's like maybe let's say 65 and above, their ability to secrete melatonin at the usual level uh, is impaired. So we know that at least in, in the elderly and in people with developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder, and as well as the people with specific internal body clock issues, that melatonin can be helpful in their type of insomnia. We're talking about the extended release version if we're talking about insomnia in the, in the elderly. So 
this is a the public uh, this is the public call uh, for better uh, melatonin uh, safety examination. This is a study done in Guelph University in 2017, and they examined 31 different types of over-the-counter melatonin. And as you know, I can walk into Rexall or London Drugs and buy tons of melatonin. I don't need a prescription for it. They, what they found was between brands, what was delivered in terms of the the the, the amount, like the how many milligrams it was, uh, compared to what was promised. It ranges from minus 83% to plus 478%. So it could be minus 83% or four to five times higher than what was promised. And that's between brands. Let's say we look at the same brand and I buy brand A in January, I compare it with its potency in uh, the brand A in uh, September. Same brand, different parts of the year. The variability was as high as 465%. So ridiculous. And then lastly, serotonin was identified as a substantial contaminant in many of these over-the-counter melatonin uh, uh, regimens. So I, I guess what I'm saying is this, uh, it's hard to get good melatonin cannabis because it's not, you know, there's, the oversight is not the same. It's not the same with prescription drugs and, and hence there's a warning. Last bit, uh, with sleeping medications uh, as a whole, the traditional challenge was that they had tremendous side effects, increased risk of falls, uh, addiction and tolerance. If we're talking about Z drugs like Zopical and Zolpidem and benzodiazepines like lorazepam, clonazepam, and diazepam. So there's a lot of work that's going into, you know, finding medications that can do sleep that don't have those side effects. Now, there, there's a condition called narcolepsy. And, nar and people with narcolepsy are irresistibly sleepy. They can't stay awake even if they wanted to. And they found that the reason why they're so sleepy is because they're missing this neurotransmitter called orexin. Orexin is what allows uh, us to stay awake. It's what's causing you to be able to stay awake and, and listen to me talk right now. So chemists, are, they came with the idea, what if we block this? Does it induce sleep? The answer is yes. So, but it's compared to traditional sleeping uh, medications, it's a lot safer. It doesn't seem to have the same risk of falls and cognitive impairment. You know, some of the choices that are out there include uh, lemborexant. Uh, it's safe in older adults. It doesn't exacerbate, doesn't worsen your sleep apnea if you have it which the Z drugs and benzodiazepines do. There's also another medication called Doritorexin. Again, uh, very safe. Um, I have some of the inf information there. And this is just a summary slide, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're thinking about medications, how do I approach this? Um, you know, if, if you have any sort of comorbidities, if you have any associated health conditions, whether you have them or not, we know that uh, the, the dual rexin receptor antagonists are safe. Same thing with the melatonin. And if you have a mood disorder, if you already have a depression and sleep issues, then you might choose to take those sedating antidepressants like doxepin uh, and I have on there trazodone and mirtazapine. So, I mean, this concludes uh, my talk today. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. And that's my email address if you want to reach out to me after. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for presenting on that. I learned a lot. There's a, and there's a lot I'm guessing everyone else has learned too. And so, um, yeah, just like it's interesting how sleep literacy isn't something that we're too informed about within our um, schooling system, but even within, you know, bereavement volunteers or the bereaved in general. So I really appreciate you coming on and doing this today. So do we have any questions? And we have about five minutes. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Dr. Mack. Oh, we got some action in the chat. <laughs> and so... What happens if the person's insomnia is in the middle of the sleep time? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have problems falling asleep. We have uh, difficulty staying asleep and maybe with some other folks that wake up too early compared to what their intended time was. We don't differentiate the three types. The treatments are the same for the three types. And, and they're equally as effective for uh, all three types. Waking up too early, problems staying asleep or problems falling asleep. We have another question coming in. Do you have any recommendations for someone who has a seizure disorder since CBTI is counterindicative? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the problem with people with seizure disorders is that if we tell them to sleep less, sometimes the lack of sleep actually increases the risk of having another seizure, which is absolutely not good. So in that scenario, uh, that, that person can do all the other elements of CBTI, but they can't do sleep restrictions. So we're not gonna ask them to push their bedtime later, but they'll do the sleep the stimulus control, right? 
waking up every day at the same time, going to bed only when you're feeling sleepy, no naps. Um, you know, you can continue with the relaxation therapy, the cognitive restructuring and the sleep hygiene, but that's the one component that you wouldn't do. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Oh, <laughs> they're flying in now. Uh, so if, uh, if you have someone who oversleeps, do you recommend the same treatment example, example, sleep restrictions? Yeah. Like, uh, so the first question I would ask is why is the person oversleeping? Right. If it's because they feel too sleepy during daytime, then that's an indication for them to get a sleep study, a sleep test, because, you know, increased tiredness, increased sleepiness during the day. A big cause of it is something like sleep apnea, which is associated with snoring and closures of your airways. It's the most common reason why people feel sleepy during the daytime. So if a person oversleeps because they're too sleepy during the day, they should go for a sleep test, a sleep study. Um, you know, there are a small minority of people. Uh, that do need like higher than average amounts of sleep. We tell as a recommendation for the general public, we say shoot for seven to eight hours of sleep. There are some people that need more than that, nine, 10 hours. But uh, if it's natural to you, then the strategy is you wake up every day by setting an alarm and then, you know, having the discipline that, okay, if I wake up from an alarm, I'm going to turn on all the lights in my room because that light exposure actually keeps us awake. Okay. I mean, another question I've heard magnesium works. Um, what form as I've seen supplements and the oils, is that true? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, that, that's actually come up quite often recently, you know, whether magnesium helps with sleep, uh, there are some studies that look at, okay, you know, if we give a, a bunch of people magnesium and then the other group, we give them a, a sugar pill, does that help sleep? There are some studies that show that it does improve things, but I wonder if it's more so that, you know, in the times where it did help, maybe those folks already had a, a problem with not having enough magnesium in their diet. Uh, I, I like we don't routinely ask people to take magnesium to improve their sleep, but if it helps, then then by all means do so. That's probably not going to hurt. And if it helps, then, then then I like that. And then we have one last question: um, When someone also has chronic fatigue syndrome and having trouble coping without naps and increased sleepiness. Yeah, and, and for folks with chron uh, chronic fatigue syndrome you know, there is a significant overlap with daytime sleepiness and maybe decreased nighttime sleep quality. So in that situation, the key to having more energy during the daytime has to do with two things. Number one, uh, for those folks in their limited uh, capacity to exercise, we will want them to exercise as much as they can. They have, they have actually shown that for people with chronic fatigue syndrome, if they apply themselves like, you know, doing cardiovascular exercise or even lifting weights as much as they can, that slowly builds up their ability uh, to get through the day, to have more alertness during the day. That's the what, the first piece. The second piece is uh, to have a better control of whatever's underlying it that's causing it. And in some folks, it means taking medications uh, that treat chronic fatigue. Um, and, and other, in other situations, it's getting the right medical workup, your blood work, imaging, to look for any other underlying causes of fatigue. And if you see one, then you correct that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. So we hope everyone here has enjoyed the session. We got a lot of thank yous, great presentation in the chat. Um, so uh, we just ask you to complete a short survey. The link is going to be in the chat. And so the registration for our next session in the series um, for the title, uh, Exploring the Role and Impact of Advanced Care Planning on Patients and Caregivers and Bereavement is scheduled um, for April 9th uh, at noon. And so once again, um, you can sign up for that. Uh, so to be notified of any other sessions, you can subscribe to our newsletter. And our aim is to have a copy of this presentation and recording with the set, with the summary notes to you within seven working days. Um, so just watch your email for that. And so we just want to thank Dr. Mack again for his knowledge and being able to sort of talk about it, like an area I'm still learning about. I know a lot of people aren't trained in this or even taught about it. And so this is so informative as we move forward, um, as we sort of raise awareness on grief and bereavement literacy. So thank you again so so much, Dr. Mack, for being here today. Thank, thank you for joining uh, me. And feel free to reach out to me by email if you, if, if you so need. Michael.mack at kmh.ca. Thank you so much for hosting, Joshua.